Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and good evening. I want to welcome you to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Julianne Harris and I will be your host this evening. So let's get right into the announcements. You know, we have these Bible studies five days a week and we do them live for a reason because we want you to interact with us. So how can you interact with us? Well, while you hear the instructor share what they're going to share tonight um, and every time that we're live, you're going to have questions that enter into your mind and we want you to submit those questions. So in whatever forum you are watching, we want you to go down to the chat section and type in your questions. And then the last 10 to 15 minutes of the Bible study, we'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. So in order for you to interact with us, you need to know our schedule. On Mondays and Fridays, we are live at 10 a.m. On Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. And Wednesday morning is at 7 a.m. And that is on Mountain Time. So please calculate it out. Tune in while we're live so you can interact with us. You can also interact with us simply by becoming a partner of this ministry, you guys. This is an amazing ministry. And I'm so proud and grateful and honored to work for a ministry such as this with such a great integrity of everyone who works here. It's just awesome. And you can be a part of all the fruit that's coming in through the ministry simply by giving or becoming a partner. So you can check that out by going to awmi.net slash give or give us a call at 719-635-1111. And also at that phone number, we have prayer ministers available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter what time you're watching. If you are going through something, listen, the world's a little bit crazy, but guess what? Did you know the word uh, addresses every single thing that you could possibly be going through? So if you're going through something and you want some help, uh, you want somebody to stand in agreement and pray for you, don't hesitate. Give them a call at 719-635-1111. So those are all my announcements. And now we get to dive into the word with Pastor Rick. McFarland. He has a church down in Colorado Springs called River Rock Church. Um, and he is also an instructor for Karis Bible College. And so he's one of our favorites. We're excited for whatever you're bringing us. I always enjoy coming to the live Bible study. So yes. I'm glad you joined us tonight. So I want to talk about something that's not been uh, understood very much in the body of Christ. It's actually been twisted into something that it's not. And so I want to actually talk to, tonight about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And so before we actually get to the verse where that's mentioned, we need to have a run up to it in context. So let's just open to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 1. It says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And so Paul's going to talk about visions and revelations. So a vision is something that you see supernaturally, and a revelation is something you know supernaturally. And so Paul said, I had both of those. I had visions and revelations of the Lord. And uh, verse 2 goes on to say, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up into the third heaven. So Paul says, I know a man very well. I'm so acquainted with this person because he's talking about himself. And so he's using the third person. And so that's what the rabbinical way of speaking of oneself in humility is to is use the third person. So he says, I just know a man in Christ, but Paul's talking about himself. And so 14 years before this writing, he had actually been caught up into heaven and saw things. And so he says in Christ. And so that was as a believer, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I don't know. God knows. So he didn't even know if he was in his physical body and was caught up in his body or in his spirit, but he just knew he was caught up. And so it says, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. I want you to see something. It said he was caught up. It didn't say he went up. He endeavored to go up. And so this was something that caught him totally off guard. He wasn't trying to do that. He wasn't seeking for this, but the Lord caught him up into this experience. So why do I bring that out? Because it's so important that in spiritual experiences like visitations of angels or a visitation of Jesus or having a vision, that's something you're invited into by the Lord. It's not something that you seek. You can't find anybody, Old Testament or new, that was actually praying for it or seeking a vision 
or a visitation when they got it. Mm. It was something that almost surprised them. They weren't expecting that. And so, again, make sure that the Lord is the one inviting you into that because Satan can come. If you keep mm. pushing, I want to hear an audible voice or I want to see something, the devil can see, show you something. So I want you to see that John, the apostle John, had a, a wonderful visitation of heaven. But I want you to see something about that before he had it. Look at Revelation chapter 4, look at verse 1. Revelation 4, 1 says, After these things I looked, this is John speaking, behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, Come up here, and I will show you things that must take place. A door standing open, and the words come up here. What are those? An invitation. When you open a door to, to your house, that's an invitation, come in here. Yeah. And so you're being invited in. And so, uh, so God opened that door and then actually gave the invitation verbally, come up here. Mm -hmm. So again, don't seek secondary forms of guidance like visitations of angels or Jesus or audible voices or things like that. That can do, God can do that, it's scriptural. But again, Satan can do those things and so we don't want to be deceived. It said he was caught up into the third heaven. So uh, Julianne, if you have a third heaven, what does that mean? <laughs> There's a first and a second. There you go. You're yes. sharp, sharp. Wow. Sharp. Third heaven. So what is the first heaven? <laughs> it is the air. It's the atmosphere. And so uh, uh, that's the first heaven. The second is space, the final frontier. <laughs> so you have space out there. And then you have the place of paradise. That's God's abode. Oh, wow. You know, man has of his own volition went into the first two. Welcome to, you know, thankful to Orville and, and uh, Wilbur Redenbacher. No, I meant Orville Wright. Wilbur oh, and Orville right. Wright. Sorry, I got that wrong. Wait. Wilbur and Orville Wright. Uh, they, they introduced us to air flight, so we've been in that heaven. But then uh, there was space flight where we visited the moon and haven't got very far out there, but we've been there. But to go to that third heaven, you need, a, you actually need a reservation. Uh, you need invitation. to put your faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, but Paul was caught up into that third heaven. Let's skip down to verse four. It says, how he was caught up into paradise how, and, and heard inexpressible words, which was not lawful for man to utter. So again, a second time it said he was caught up. He didn't go up or went up. And so paradise. And so we find that there's a great place waiting for us called paradise. I love that word, paradise. I do too. And so... Uh, it says that he saw, he heard things and saw things there that was inexpressible. That means he could not put words mm -hmm. in his natural language to explain it. Then it says what's not lawful for a man to utter. It didn't say what the Lord said, it was not lawful for me. He said, no, it's not lawful for a man to utter them. Mm -hmm. And so be careful because on YouTube and all kinds of books are being written today that people that I've uh, died, I went to heaven yeah. and I'm not doubting that Paul had that happen. But just be careful when, when they come back and make their YouTube videos and they write their books, be careful of teachings and writings about things people saw in heaven or hell that you cannot find in the Bible. Mm. Don't let other people's experiences be a benchmark for doctrine or truth. Yeah. Make sure that it's in line with the word. And so he moves on in verse seven. So this is now talking about the thorn in the flesh. Verse seven, Paul says, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now there's probably not a single verse in the Bible that's been twisted. I know, right? And, and, <laughs> and uh, torn apart and made to say the opposite. Yes. And so let's look at this, take a careful look at what this verse is saying tonight. So it says, lest I should be exalted above measure. Most commentators will say that means that he would be lifted up in pride yes. in arrogance mm -hmm. and, and puffed up because of the revelations. And that's why the thorn in the flesh was given to Paul. Right. But let's look at the words exalted above measure. It's from a Greek word, which means to be lifted up higher or above has nothing to do with pride. It just says to be lifted up higher or above. And this is in the passive voice in the Greek. There's three voices in the Greek. There's the active where some, the, the person does the action uh, or passive that something's done to that person. Okay. 
And the middle voice is where that person does it for themselves or to themselves. Okay. So if you lift yourself up, that would be the middle voice. Right. Uh, or active that he did it. Okay. But it's the passive mm -hmm. that, that he got lifted up and got exalted okay. through the revelations. What is this saying? That when you get the revelation of the Word of God, it always elevates you. It always exalts you. Revelation brings, uh, revelation brings transformation that always brings elevation. Mm. God exalts you in every area of life. And so you start being seen uh, pro prominent. People start seeing you prospering. Yeah. People start seeing you in victory where there is no victory. And so that comes through revelation. And so Paul was being exalted. His ministry was standing out. God was doing mighty miracle signs and wonders and the revelations coming forth was doing damage to Satan because he was teaching the revelations and setting people free. So his ministry was growing, growing and mushrooming and Satan said, I got to stop this. And so, so lest he be exalted or raised up higher above measure, an abundance of, by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan. A messenger of who? <laughs> A messenger of Satan. Mm. How many times I've read in commentaries that said God, God sent it. Yeah. How do you get that, that verse? It didn't say messenger of God. It says a messenger of Satan. Yeah, that's true. And so a lot of people think, well, then, well, God allowed the devil. He sent the devil to do it. Let me say something. The devil and God are not on the same side. <laughs> They're not on the same team. And he's not, and the and the devil's not on God's payroll. Amen. Where he's his errand boy and you're gonna go do what I said to do. No, it wasn't sent from God. Read it. It says a messenger of Satan. And so again, this verse is saying that the revelations Paul received would cause him to be lifted up and exalted, so that he would be so conspicuous to everyone around him, his ministry would have such a great impact, Satan sent a messenger to stop him, to bring him down. And he did this by a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Look at this thorn in the flesh. Many get it so wrong when tr they try to pinpoint what the thorn was. And there's all kinds of ideas out there. Some, most commentators say it was a physical sickness that he had. There's no way to put, where do you find that in there? And so a thorn in the flesh, but it says it was a sickness. And a lot of commentators say he had an eye disease. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that he had uh, pus running down his eyes. Now where did that come from? Is I have no idea. But the that's the most popular, out of, you look at all the commentaries. Yeah. It just had, he had ophthalmia, you know, he had pus running. Oh, poor Paul, can't even look, he's a monster. <laughs> <clears throat> what was this thorn? Let's, why don't we use the Bible to interpret the Bible? This is good. It's a novel thought. Let's do that. Amen. Let's see what the Bible says thorns are in the flesh. Look at Numbers 33, look at verse 55. We're going to find out what they are. Numbers 33, 55 says, but if you do not drive out, speaking, uh, Moses speaking about the Israelites going into the promised land, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be the, those that you let remain will become irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, thorns in your flesh, and they shall harass you. And the, in the land where you dwell. Here we see, what are those thorns? Persecution? Yeah, people. Harassment? <laughs> being harassed? <laughs> Have you ever been harassed by people? <laughs> Harassment or whatever? <laughs> look, at, look at Joshua. Don't make me laugh. Okay, sorry. Joshua 23, <laughs> the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let's see this established. Amen. Joshua 23, look at verse 13. It says, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations but before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God had given you. These nations would be harassing them, would be persecuting them. They would become thorns to them. Mm. Look at Judges, finally, Judges chapter 2, look at verse 3. It says, Therefore I have also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. So here we see a thorn of, is a messenger sent to harass Paul, to persecute Paul. And wherever Paul went, he saw persecution. Yeah. You could see that sure. in the book of Acts. Everywhere he went, there seems to be a supernatural force. It didn't seem to make sense, but people get stirred up and they would either uh, beat him or they would uh, kick him out of town, put him in prison. But constantly there was persecution stirred up wherever he went. And said, a, a messenger of Satan mm -hmm. to buffet me. 
And so I want you to see something. A messenger was sent from someone. Who was the messenger sent from? Again, vitally important to get the source right. It was Satan, no. not God. Next, I want you to see the thorn was a messenger. A messenger. Mm. A messenger is always an entity. A messenger. The Greek word angelos, where you get angel, mm. but also a messenger. And so a messenger is always an entity, not a thing. So it couldn't be sickness. Sickness is not an entity. It's no. a thing. No. And so this was a fallen spirit sent to harass Paul wherever he went. And so this Greek, this Greek word buffet means to strike the fist over and over and over again. And so this is, you could read this, a messenger sent from Satan to buffet me. <laughs> now, many Christians have had messengers from Satan to buffet them. They have pizza delivery drivers showing up. Amen. And, but, yes. that, but that's your own fault. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Clearly, we see this was a messenger of Satan, not God, yes. to buffet him. <laughs> and we saw from the word thorn above, it's speaking of persecution, not mm -hmm. sickness. Lest I be exalted above measure. Again, mm -hmm. oh, poor Paul, he was in pride. He got in such pride about this. We, so so uh, God let the devil come humble him. Okay, let's say that's the case, that God sent the devil or the devil went to Paul to keep him humble. Put your thinking cap on. Why would the devil want to humble Paul? Why, what's, the, what's the goal of Satan? To get you in pride. Yeah, right. He's not in the business of causing people to be humble. He's in the business of causing people to be lifted up in pride. Because right. pride comes before a fall. That's right. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Mm -hmm. Look at 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And so, you know what? If Paul was in pride, Satan would just leave him alone because pride goes before destruction. Yeah. And so, uh, if you wanted him not to be exalted, well, don't let him be humble because if he got humble, he would be exalted. That's it. See, it's just totally wrong. Satan sent a messenger to stir up persecution to Paul so that his ministry would not be exalted, would not be seen by all, would not grow. And Satan sent someone to stop him. Verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Well, Pastor, you just said it was an entity. Here in verse 8, it says a thing. Well, actually, that's not a good translation from the Greek language. The Greek actually says instead of this thing, it says of this one. Of this one, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. It was an entity, a fallen spirit from Satan. And pleaded three times for it to go away. Paul was like most Christians. Most Christians' prayer life is either praying in things that they want in their life they don't have, yeah. or praying out things or people in their life they don't want. <laughs> Amen. Well, Paul here is like most Christians, <laughs> and he's praying this out of his life. It's causing trouble. It's causing him to be uh, constantly uh, irritated and in pain uh, emotionally. Paul prayed like most Christians that it would go away, and God said, both, all three times, no, no, no. Paul, Paul prayed three times. Now, I didn't know if he went, got to God the Father and he said no, and then said, I'll go to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus? How about no. the Holy Spirit? No, he tried to pin them against each other. Like, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit, how about you? No. And I, I doubt that happened. God, God the Father said, no, 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 no. Why would God say no to a prayer request? Doesn't God always say yes to prayer requests? Not always. Mm -hmm. We're going to find out why did he say no? I want you to see something. Why? Because we've been redeemed from sin. We've been redeemed from sickness. We've been redeemed from poverty. We can go to God and get healed. We can go to God and overcome habits of sin. We can overcome poverty, receive prosperity. God's answer is always yes and amen to our, those prayer requests. But why was Paul getting a no, no, no? Because guess what? We're not redeemed from persecution. Wow. Look at 2 Timothy 3.12. Hmm. It says, yes... And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's a promise. Now, it's not in your promise box, no. but it is a promise. <laughs> but, what, but if God said yes and I'll let Paul do that, what would have happened to Paul? Paul? He would have had to remove Paul from his ministry assignment, his kingdom assignment. 
Because persecution lies right in the path of our kingdom assignment. Why do we have trials in life? Not because we're in a classroom where God's teaching us things. Now, your classrooms right now, you're learning. Your classrooms, your church services. Your, your classrooms, your Bible time in the morning. But when you leave your house, you go out into the battlefield. You're going to go out in Satan's world. And you're going to be a billboard. You're going to be a missionary. You're going to go out in his room. And you're going to be attacked. That's why we have trials. And so again, we're not on carnal cruise lines. <laughs> we are on a battlefield. That's why you have armor. And Amen. that's why it's supposed to be on the front, not the back. And so Paul, that's why Paul got a no every time because Paul, for me to remove you out of your kingdom, because that's the only way you can get this persecution to stop. Wow. Is if you were not, if you did not fulfill your kingdom assignment. And so we have in a kingdom site and we're praying, trying to pray, God, remove me from this, remove this situation for me. And God says, no, in many cases, no, because that's, that's the path I have you on. Wow. That's your kingdom assignment. And so I'm going to give you something better than taking you out of your kingdom assignment. We're going to find out what did God give Paul instead of the no. There's another person that prayed three times and the Lord said, no. Probably the, the most powerful prayer person, but he is the most powerful prayer person that's ever lived on the planet. His name is Jesus. Hmm. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, oh. he said to the Father, Lord, let this cup pass. of suffering, let this cup pass from me. That was a prayer request. Yeah. Let it pass from me. Now, he did caveat with that, not my will, but your will be done. He was open for that, but he did ask. Yeah. We'll let this, if you please let this pass for me. Three times he prayed and guess what? No. Mm. What would have happened if God said yes to that prayer? It would have moved him out of his kingdom assignment yeah. of redemption. And so a lot of times, the times when God says no, it's because he doesn't want, he, we'd have to be moved out of our kingdom assignment for him to say no to, our, to us. And then when he says no, it's always something he has better in, in exchange. We're going to see that. Next I saw that he prayed that three times that it would depart from me. Actually, the Greek translation, instead of it might depart from me, is that he might depart from me. It, in the Greek, it's a uh, masculine noun, mm. that he would depart from me. Now let's go to verse 9. So he said, no, Paul, but then he gave him something. Instead of the no, I'm going to give you something better. Instead of moving you out of your assignment, I'm going to give you something better. Look at, he said in verse 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly will I rather boast in my infirmities, that's weaknesses in the Greek, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so he said to me, my grace is sufficient. And so God said no to the prayer request, but gave him something better. He says, I have my grace. Mm -hmm. I have strength. I got power for you. That's going to cause you to overcome and fulfill your ministry assignment. I'm going to take you through that problem and you're going to fulfill the, co the kingdom assignment I've given you. My grace is sufficient. Notice my grace is sufficient. Not the grace will be sufficient, may be sufficient. The grace is present tense sufficient. I love this verse. Why? Because in five minutes when I read it, is as is, mm -hmm. is sufficient right yeah, now for right what now. I'm facing. Whatever I'm facing in my path and God's will and the path he's called me to do, I don't care what obstacles in the way. I don't want Satan thrown at me. Yeah. His grace is sufficient. Right now. It's yeah. sufficient. Yeah, that's that good. means to be possessed of unfailing strength, sufficient. Mm. Possessed of unfailing strength to be enough. And so when we fail, it's because we fail to appropriate God's grace by faith in that moment. So he says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. God has strength available to you. Look at that word strength. It's the Greek word dunamis. Mm -hmm. We get the word power. My power is made perfect in your weakness. What's weakness? An inability. Yeah. An inability. And so Paul said, my, or God said to Paul, my power is is made perfect in your inability. Mm. You know, God's power is available to you, but it's not been perfected in most Christians. Why? Because they've not appropriated it. They haven't allowed that strength to come in and overcome their inability. Why? <clears throat> because most people are trying to overcome their weaknesses. They're trying, they're, they're embarrassed of their weaknesses. They're trying to hide their weaknesses. They're trying to overcome their weaknesses. Paul said, I boast in my weaknesses. Yeah. 
I boast in why? Because then God's power can actually be demonstrated in my life. And guess who gets the glory when he's, when God's power enables you to do what you couldn't do in your own inability? He gets the glory. So a weakness is an inability. We as humans are very averse to admit that we're not able to do something. Mm -hmm. We'll try and try and try. You get this little Barney Fife guy. He'll go into Gold's Gym, mm -hmm. put 350 pounds on the bar. <laughs> I'm going to try. I know I can't do it, but I'm going to give a, I'm going to try. <laughs> cool. Get it off, get it off, get it off. <laughs> and people one after another will get, <laughs> we can't, we, we just, for something within us, can't admit an inability, but there's weaknesses God left in your flesh that only God's power can overcome them. Mm. Wow. Well, pastor, what about Philippians 4.13? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it say, I can do all things? No, it doesn't. Because you didn't read the whole verse. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. But oftentimes when you're trying to overcome your own inability or your own weakness, God's grace is there, but it can't be it can't be appropriated. When you're trying, grace can't come in. Mm -hmm. He's not going to share it. You're going to have to put a white flag up and say, I can in that area. You ever ask when God says, I want you to love that person? Yeah. And you try to love that person, your own energy and your own ability, and all you want to do is slap them. <laughs> I want to slap them, Jesus. <laughs> but you can say, you know what? But your grace, Amen. your power is sufficient. And I believe I have it now. And it's operating now. Receive it now. And then all of a sudden, you're empowered to love that person and it's supernatural and he gets the glory for it. So you need to learn something in John 15 verse 5. Apart from Christ, what can you do? Nothing. John 15 5, this is in the red. Jesus said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. See, a lot of Christians want to be the vine. Right. They want to be, they want to produce the Christian life. You never were called to produce the Christian life. Only Jesus produces the Christian life. You're to manifest the Christian life. You're the branch. Mm. Julianne, you make a pitiful vine. Amen. I make a pitiful vine. <laughs> you make a pitiful vine. <laughs> Yay. But you're a beautiful branch. Amen. Beautiful branch. Yes, gorgeous. Jesus said, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. We just simply don't believe that I'm going to overcome this weakness, this flesh, this weakness I have in the flesh, this weakness I have in my life, the thing that, that has come against me, I can overcome it. I can handle it. I can do it. Well, without me, you can do nothing. Often we beg God to remove our weakness, but God wants to place his power and strength over your weakness and inability and lift you up over it. Amen. Every year as a singles pastor, I would take our singles group floating down the Illinois River. Mm -hmm. And some years we'd have a lot of rain. And so it was, it was pretty high tide and, or high river. And then there's some that didn't have much rain at all. And there'd be sections of river where there was not a, there was just enough water to cover the rocks, but enough not for the boat to actually get over some boulders. Right. And so I would, there'd be times we'd hit these rocks and we'd have to move rocks out of the way. And. You know, a lot of Christians are like that. They're, they're, there's boulders in their way. There's obstacles in their way. And they say, Lord, please remove the obstacle. Please move that thing in my way. That person, Sister Bucketmouth, Brother Flip a Lip, <laughs> that sandpaper person, that boss, that situation. Lord, remove them. Get them out of my life. Move those, those obstructions out of my way. But God says, no, I got something better for you. Instead of moving the boulders away, I'll send more water. Amen. A flood of water called grace. Amen. And that water comes and it lifts up the boat and you float over the boulders. Amen. That's what God wants you to do in the middle because any other thing would remove you out of the path God has for you for your kingdom assignment. It's okay to ask for a reassignment, but so many people, they don't like their job. They don't like the relationship they're in. So they say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to get, I'm going to remove myself. But wait a minute, you're about to go AWOL. Many of you are about to get AWOL, get out of the will of God. You need to check in with HQ, headquarters. And sometimes God will allow you to have a, a, a he'll let you have an assignment change. But most of the time it's no. But I have something better for you. I have grace. I have a flood that can lift you up and carry you over 
that will enable you to do what you can't possibly do in your own self. Those, Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I'll boast, I'll brag about my weaknesses. Most Christians, they don't, they're embarrassed of their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. They hide them. They try to overcome them. Not Paul. Paul says, I'm glad I have a weakness because guess what? Your grace will come and rest over me because it says that the power of Christ will rest upon me. Look at that word power. It's dunamis again. But rest upon is a Greek word which means to fix a tent or a tabernacle upon. It's the, it's the use for, it's the word for the, putting up a tabernacle of the Old Testament. So many Christians experience God's power very infrequently because they're trying to overcome or get rid of their weaknesses themselves. We need to receive God's tabernacling grace, His tent of power. He wants to place His tent of power over your inability and enable you to do what you could never do yourself, lift you up over that situation, cause you to overcome, and then He gets the glory for it. Mm. The tabernacle was erected in the wilderness. The temple was in the, actually when they got in the promised land, but what did they have in the wilderness? A tabernacle. Yeah. The worst environment on the planet. It was arid. It was hot. There was no sustenance. But God provided a tabernacle mm. to provide shade and respite from the harsh conditions. What does God want to do in your hard situation? He wants to put a tabernacle of grace, a tent of His power over you. Put it right over your weakness. And, and, and then when He enables you to do what you can't do, no one will see that weakness because it's been covered. But you know, you know that it, it was God. Yeah. And then you can't get in pride. Yeah. This is how Paul lived. How could a Paul have gotten in such pride when he had revelation of grace? Mm-hmm. And Paul walked in this. He wasn't in pride. He was being lifted up by the power of God. He was humbling himself and God was exalting him and Satan tried to stop him. The power of the Spirit makes the Christian thrive in what environment they find themselves in. That's the power of a Christian. And no matter what environment God drops you in, what kind of persecution you have, you can thrive because you have a resource on the inside that's greater than the outside. Amen. Psalms 92, 12 says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar of a Lebanon. There's something interesting about a palm tree is that almost, uh, it's different than any other tree. Mm-hmm. All other trees uh, get their sustenance through its bark. You can actually wring a tree. Well, you can cut through the bark of a tree, uh, cut through the bark, and the nutrients will come up and stop and won't be able to come up any further and kill a tree by wringing a tree. But a palm tree, you can wring a, a palm tree, but it doesn't get its sustenance through its bark. It gets its sustenance through its core. Oh, wow. It says the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. And so a Christian can take a, a ringing and keep on singing. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> Guys, many are seeking to be free from the problems that stand on their current path. And they're asking God for a change. And God's saying, no. To do that would remove you from my kingdom purpose. To remove you from your kingdom assignment. I got something better for you. I have grace. I want to pitch my tabernacle of power. I tend to power over your weakness. I want to, just, I want, I want to display myself in the middle of that situation. And then my power will be displayed in this earth. Your assignment will be fulfilled, and I get the glory in the end of it. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for those that are out there having a difficult time. They're in a difficult environment, different, a difficult relationship. They're, they're, in a, they're, they're facing things that they can't do in the natural, and they've been trying to overcome it. They've been habits in the flesh. They've had certain habits that they, year, time and time again, they fall over, and then they try again, and they try again to overcome it, and they hate it, and they're trying to overcome their weaknesses. But tonight, I pray that they would have a revelation instead of hating it. They can say, thank you that I have that weakness. So now I, your grace is sufficient right now. And I'm asking that you would tabernacle your power right over that weakness. And that you'll cause me to overcome by your power. And then you get the glory for it. Your power for my inability. Father, I thank you for what you're doing, that revelation you're giving people. And you're bringing them up, bringing them over 
You're sending a flood of grace that's lifting them over the rocks and the boulders of their situations and causing them to, to float right on over it. And Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, that was powerful. So uh, you guys have submitted great questions. I'm actually going to jump in front of the line because I'm curious about this because I know a lot of people don't know how to differentiate between uh, persecution and some people are just really self-centered and <laughs> they're obstinate. They're just miserable with people, but they're chucking that up as persecution when right. it's not. So how can we tell the difference between? Yeah, oftentimes we're the cause of our own problem. That's it. And sometimes on the outside, you can look and be like, yeah. And we blame it on the devil. Yeah, it's not yeah, the it devil. Says it's that, not that it says that if, if we are suffering according to the will of God, yeah. where we're trusting God actually in faith and walking in the path He's called us to do, and we're getting attacked for it, there's glory to that. There's power for that. There's that. But there's no glory or grace in uh, being buffeted or being beaten for your own faults, mm. for you being in sin. Mm. And so, so many Christians are just living in the flesh, they're living carnal. Yeah. And so, grace, uh, grace doesn't remove you from consequences of your actions. Grace empowers you to be able to live in a way uh, to walk in the Spirit. And so, if you're walking in the flesh, that means you're not trusting God. Amen. You're just walking in the flesh, and then you're not walking toward the Word of God, not walking in faith. You're getting consequences, but don't call that persecution. And so, there's no glory to that. But when you're walking in faith, you're walking in the plan, and we all know yeah. if, we're, if we have inside that we're doing the right thing. Yeah. Our conscience is clear. Right. If, if our conscience bugs us that we're not really doing what we ought to do, and then we're getting the bad consequences, that's not persecution. But you know what? For that, God has mercy. He does. It says, come to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy mm -hmm. and find grace to help you in time of need. Amen. So oftentimes we're the cause of our own problems, and God will give us mercy, but then give us fine grace to do it right. Yeah, that's it. Man, that's powerful. That's awesome. Okay, so now you guys get to ask your questions. <laughs> um, so Gail on Facebook says, does the Word of God prosper in the midst of persecution? It, matter of fact, it does the best. Uh, uh, a diamond shines the brightest in, the, in a dark, when you put it uh, in, a, in a jewelry store, you want to see the brightness of a diamond? Yeah. They don't put it on a white cloth. No, they don't. They put it on right. a black cloth. Yeah. And so the Word of God uh, works the best in the time of trouble and trials. And so it's just brought forth that God's promises, His deliverance, His grace is seen the greatest when your trial is the greatest. You know, the church has never been mo more powerful in church history than when it's persecuted. Yeah, it's true. Not that you should seek, per well, Jesus, I want to pray for persecution. No, <laughs> you're weird. <laughs> but, but you can trust God in the worst situations and God's Word manifests itself in such a great way. His grace is perfected. His strength is perfected in your weakness. Man, that's good. So, um, I'm going to read this question, but I mean, you may have just answered it. So, Samaya on YouTube says, how is God's power made perfect in weakness as mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12, 9? Yeah. So, it's made perfect it's when you appropriate it. Right. It's just like healing. God's provided healing for everyone. Yeah. By His stripes you were healed. Right. But some are not appropriating the healing. So whatever God provides by grace, you have to appropriate it by faith. But before you appropriate God's power, you first have to admit you can't. Because mm. as long as you're still trying, you're frustrating grace. Right. Because grace is what God does for man, not what man does for God. And sometimes we want to do half of it, and then God's grace do the other half. And no, you destroy grace. It's either all your works all your effort, all your strength, or all of God's grace, you receive it by faith. And so how is, how is the power of God, the grace of God perfected, is when you admit, I can't, I have an inability, I'm not going to stop trying, and I'm actually not going to hate my weakness, I'm not going to try to overcome my weakness, but I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, for your power that's going to tabernacle over that, and you're going to lift me up and enable me to finally overcome that area I've been trying to do for so long, and then He gets glory. Man, that's just so... That, what perfected means reach its goal. What was the goal of God's power? For it to actually enable you, fill up your low spots, yeah. to fill up your inabilities with His strength, and enable you to do what you couldn't do. Yeah. And so, appropriating that practically every time 
that you know in your weakness that you've tried over and over and over again a certain thing, stop trying. To say, God, I can't, but your grace is sufficient. And I, right now, by faith, I believe it's tabernacling, covering over me right now. And then you're going to find yourself doing something, being free in an area, and it's God, it's God's doing. Wow, that's awesome. Because I think a lot of people can struggle with, well, at some point I have to say no, right? Like I have to be an active participant. In you have to say no, but then you have to have the strength to back that to up. To back that up. And so God gives you, you, you're to say no, but he provides you the strength to back it up. Nice. See, in the Old Testament, you said you were to say no. Say no, you shall not, shall not, shall right. not. So they kept saying no, 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 but didn't have the power. No, they didn't. God didn't provide any power into the law. And it actually started. Matter of fact, there's not, out of the 613 commandments of the law, not one of them is to pray. Oh, wow. Because pray is dependence on God's resources. And under the law, it's all under you. So it's all, it's either all law or all grace. You don't mix the two. Mm. And so, so you're going to have to say, you know what? No, but I'm not going to be able in my own ability to overcome it. But I, your grace is sufficient. Amen. Your power and, and strength is sufficient for me right now. And it's going to rest over me and enable me to do what I couldn't do. And then when grace is received, God always gets the glory. If you do it, you get the glory. That's it. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Um, so Malcolm on Facebook says, when you have gone off track, uh, what is the best way to get back in communion with God? Well, when you got off track, you stopped trusting God. Oh, man. You got your eyes that's on true. yourself and get your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and Jesus is the author of faith. And so there's three steps. Look at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Keep on, on looking, looking at, at Jesus. Jesus. When you got off track, Hallelujah. you stopped looking at Jesus. Amen. When Peter stopped looking at Jesus, Amen. walking on the water, he began to sink. So get your eyes back on the, on, on the Word of God, on the promises of God, which is a representation or mirror of Jesus. You keep looking and putting your faith in Him and what He's done for you, and you'll, you'll get back on track. So start trusting Jesus instead of yourself. So this is really good. Um, <clears throat> Tiffany on YouTube says, I have come to know that I am very self-centered. I want to change, but there's so much that needs to change. How do I work on these weaknesses while maintaining, st or remaining steadfast? See, that's our problem. We want to work mm. on our weaknesses. Yeah, that's true. It's so subtle, but we're trying to overcome our own weaknesses. Yeah. No, sweetheart. Paul didn't say, I'm working on my weaknesses. He says, I boast in my weaknesses. So that when I admit that I'm weak and when I admit that I can't do it, I put the white flag up. Mm -hmm. I put my faith. God's grace is sufficient. His grace will, over, will tabernacle over that weakness. It's not removed. He'll tabernacle over it and enable me by power to be able to do what I could not do. And so it's not working on your weaknesses. That's the law. The law promised you had to work on yourself. And the more you work on yourself, you think you're making progress. It's kind of like trying to clean your feet off standing in a mud puddle. Mm -hmm. You pick one foot up, clean that off looking pretty good, but then you put it back down and lift up the other one and clean that off thinking, hey, I made a lot of progress. But really, you're not making any progress. And so is, it's going to be 100% law, you're, you overcoming your weaknesses, or we, when will you let grace do it? When will you finally say, I'm not going to try to work on my weaknesses anymore. I'm not going to try to fix myself anymore. But I'm going to realize that God's grace and God, what God has done in Jesus Christ is perfect. Amen. I'm going to let that be perfected in me instead of me trying to do it. Amen. Man, that's good. Um, so we have a guest on email that says, how did Paul boast in his weaknesses? Did he start out a sermon letting everyone know his weaknesses? Like, can you expound? Well, Paul listed it in, in 2 Corinthians 11. He had a whole list of things that, that hit his life. And he says, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to boast here, but I'm going to boast in my weaknesses and my infirmities and the things that, it, the hardships that I have to go through that I couldn't go through. He said he took stripes above measure. Yeah. No human being could have took as many stripes and keep at it. Yeah. I've been out of the ministry the first whip. <laughs> Me too. I'm, I'm like, done. Quit. I'm retired, Jesus. <laughs> he said stripes above measure. <laughs> yeah. He got stoned, yeah. raised up, and went back into the city and pre preached again. Yeah. What enabled him? Oh, he was just a strong Christian. No, he was weak. Mm. But he knew how to tap into God's power, His, his wow. grace, enabled him to do. Paul says, I outworked all the apostles, yet not I. So you need to learn the yet not I before, but it was the grace of God with me. 
Amen. So I think a lot of people, myself included, you know, when you were talking about how he boasts in his weakness, it's like he's getting up in front of people and, you know, being like, so I kicked the dog when I was walking from some no, area, right? He wasn't boasting like, in front of other people, really. He was just saying, God, I'm so, I thank you, Lord, yeah. that, that there's this, that weakness in my life so that you can get the glory through this. Amen. You're going to, your power is going to be seen through this and I can't possibly do it, but I have, I'm going to boast in glory, actually boast in your power in your glory, I'm going to actually thank you, Lord, that, that I can now actually see you manifested more and you're going to get more glory through this than ever before. And so he didn't try to hide his weaknesses. He didn't hate them. He didn't yes, try so to true. overcome them. So good. He let grace overcome. Amen. Amen. And so that's how he boasted, not yeah. necessarily to people, but he was like, yeah. okay, this is a weakness. I'm glad you're sufficient. God's about to get the glory through you're this. You're about to do something amazing Amen. here because I can't do it. Amen. Man, that is powerful. But there's something within us that cannot say, I can't do it. Yeah. Go back to John 15, 5. Mm. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Wow. But Amen. you can do all things through Christ who strengthens Amen. you. Amen. Praise God. Man, that was powerful. I know you guys have been blessed. You know, if you want some supplemental teaching or direction more into the word on certain subjects, you know, give us a call. We have prayer ministers available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So give us a call at 719-635-1111. You can also check out Pastor Rick's teaching on his website. And so that is riverrockchurch.org. Net. Dot net. It's the fish in the net. Ah, the net. <laughs> so anyways, he's got all of his teachings on there. I, I promise you would be blessed if you went and checked it out. So thanks, Pastor Rick. Thanks. Great, have, great being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. I just remembered, you guys, we have Grace Encounters starting this evening. So like literally uh, you have 10 minutes to go you know, uh, potty break and get some food, get some snacks and tune back in and, um, see what grace has done. See what grace has done. Praise God. So it'll be tonight all day tomorrow. Well, most of the day tomorrow and then on Saturday morning. So we would love for you to tune in and don't forget we do have live Bible study tomorrow at 10 AM as well, but, um, have a great night. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Bye. Did you know the first step in finding God's will is knowing that God has a specific plan for your life? Abba Father is the one that knows where you came from. He knows why you're here. He knows who you are. And He knows where you're going. And He knows how to get you there. You'll be surprised to see what God can do through you. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.